Greetings, students, and welcome to the special edition of The Professor Travel, domestic edition. I am your host, The Professor Travel, coming to you from Southern California. This is the website, the vlog, and the podcast that you come to in order to learn more about different travel destinations. This is where we come as a community in order to discuss more. Hopefully, this will inspire you to travel more and ultimately to enjoy life more. Now, you can reach me at a variety of different social media platforms, including but not exclusive to my website, which is at theprofessortravel.com, on YouTube, on Facebook, and now on TikTok, you can find me there at The Professor Travel. If you're an Instagrammer, you can find me there at the underscore professor underscore travel. If you're a Twitter, -er -er, then you can find me on Twitter at The Professor TR1. And then finally, if you are a blogger, you can find me on Blogspot at theprofessortravel.blogspot.com. Today, I am welcoming my visiting professor, Scott Cobalt. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, sir. How about you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for doing this wonderful uh, presentation with me here um, on the great state of Montana. Uh, but for the benefit of my students, can you maybe share with us a little bit about your educational background and maybe some places that you traveled before? Yeah. Um, so as far as education goes, I have a uh, bachelor degree, Bachelor of Arts uh, in Broadcast Journalism from the University of Montana. And I'm um, currently a graduate student in Brandman University's Master's in Psychology program with a marriage and family therapy emphasis. So quite a, quite a change of tra uh, professional tra trajectory there. Um, and speaking of trajectory, I, uh, I love traveling. My wife and I um, basically built our relationship that way. And um, together in about, in eight years, we've traveled about 70,000, no, 70, I'd say we're probably about 80,000 miles. So we're at about 10,000 miles a year we travel together. Wow. And we've gone just about everywhere in Washington, Oregon, Northern California, uh, Panhandle of Idaho. Uh, we've, we've kind of gone around Montana a bit. I've introduced her to that. Um, we've also been to Nevada, Arizona, Texas, um, I don't know if I'm leaving any out. And then we we have yet to take her uh, to Canada or no, we actually did go to Canada. I'm sorry. I took her there for her birthday in 2018 to Victoria, BC. Uh, and then we've been to Barbados together as well. Very nice. Very nice. Good collection of locations. It sounds like it's been a lot of fun for you. Now, as I was making mention, we are talking about the great state of Montana, where I believe you grew up in. Is that correct? That is correct. Awesome. So I know virtually nothing about Montana other than it's one of our largest states. So for the benefit of the students, as well as myself, can you share with us a little bit about the history of Montana? Yeah, so, um, you know, Mo Montana was inhibited, inhabited, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> inhabited by, uh, by Native Americans, uh, and, and, you know, still is, of course, but, uh, you know, only Native Americans until you know, the settlers started arriving. And of course, you know, we all well know that uh, Lewis and Clark kind of paved the way for that. They made their famous trip in, what was it, 1804 through 1806 or something like that. And so there's a lot about Lewis and Clark in Montana. Mm -hmm. um, but before the settlers arrived, of course, it was Native Americans, and then settlers did arrive and, and you know, started establishing, um, you know, ranches and farms and so forth. And as Montana's developed, uh, it, it, well, I guess it has developed because prime, because prime of, um, shoot, kind of losing my words here, but uh, primarily timber, agriculture and mining have, and, and tourism as well, really helped build the state. As far as recent history, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the same mining, timber, tourism, <laughs> and uh, agriculture. Not much changes in Montana, um, and currently the population is a, is just over a million. I think it it uh, broke a million when I moved out of there in two thousand and ten. You know, it's one of those places that really surprises me because the size of the state is is very very large geographically speaking, but when it comes to the population, it's actually not very large speaking. I mean, we can see that in terms of the electoral college. I mean, it's only got up to about a million, and like the county where I live is almost that big. So in terms of geography, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's huge in size and majestic in the way in which it looks. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous as you can see from a couple of the pictures on, on the screen right now. And by the way, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, please feel free to come over to the YouTube channel on at the professor travel so you can check it out. Um, but 
can you tell me a little bit about in terms of the state like what are some of the other states that surround the great state of montana yeah to the to the west idaho borders uh, montana and then uh, well to the west and the south and then to the southeast uh you have wyoming and south dakota and then directly to the east is north dakota and then of course directly north is canada yeah do you, how how close were you to the border when you were living there do you remember uh, ooh. a couple hours. Yeah, Montana, it's so big. We don't really measure in distance. We measure in hours. So I, when I lived in Great Falls as a child, uh, I think we were about three or so hours away from the border of Canada. That's not too bad. It gives you a good change of pace if you want to travel. Uh, one of the other things that I'm a little bit surprised about is that there hasn't been a lot of urban development in the state of Montana. It seems like for the most part, like you were saying, it's been mining, it's been agriculture for the entire length of time of the state. But that's part of its charm too, it would seem. You know, there's that, yeah. that there's that, there's that, um, if you like a rural paradise, this is one of those states that you would go in order to kind of just get away from it all, it's, it would seem. Yeah. It's, um, and here's an interesting tidbit for you, speaking of population before I forget, Montana and Japan have roughly the same land area. <laughs> and in Japan, or yeah, in Japan, you've got about 126 million. In Montana, you have 1 million. Um, <laughs> there, there are literally more cattle in Montana than there are people. That's, wow. that's a fact. Um, but it's really, you know, it's really nice growing up there. Uh, I grew up in towns that were around 30,000 population and uh, just big enough to have some some nice, uh, nice luxuries that, you know, people in bigger cities enjoy, but then small enough to where, you know, you didn't, you didn't ever feel crowded. <clears throat> and one of the things that has really struck me in traveling back to Montana, because I currently reside in Oregon in the Portland area, going back to Montana, uh, I was completely unaware of this when I lived there, but there's hardly any traffic. I mean, when you go on a drive in the country on, on the interstate, on a busy Saturday evening, you might run into a couple of cars. I mean, cars are very few and far between, and it's so nice. You know, you don't have the traffic jams. You can just kind of putz around and enjoy the scenery. <laughs> How is the weather there during the different times of the year? I love that you asked me about this because I'm kind of a weather nerd and, uh, and I, I'm really proud of being from Montana. And so Montana is, when it comes to weather, is the land of extremes. Um, <clears throat> Montana's uh, record high temperature was 117 degrees. Mm. Montana has the record low raw temperature for the lower 48 states. Uh, it was uh, negative 70 degrees raw temperature was recorded near uh, Helena, Montana, where I graduated from high school. At Rogers Pass, it was in January of 1954, 70 below. So you have a variance of 187 degrees, which is the greatest variance of any state. Um, and, and again, 70 below is the, the lowest, uh, it's the record for the lowest recorded raw temperature in the lower 48. And then uh, some other interesting things, uh, the greatest shift in temperature, I think in the world that ever has ever been recorded occurred in Montana, <clears throat> excuse me. They were uh, in at minus 40 or minus 50. Um, and then Montana experiences what they call these Chinook winds. They're basically warm winds that come down out of Canada and they're really warm. <clears throat> and anyway, the, the temperature changed uh, 103 degrees within a 24 hour time span. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that, 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 how do you prepare for something like that? That's gotta be insane. Well, it went from cold to warm, so I think I think people were okay with it. But it had it gone the other way, they might have been a little. About it, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you guys get any type of um, like severe weather conditions? Something like uh, blizzards, or I mean, apart from the Chinook, I should say, but uh, like blizzards or uh, earthquakes, and anything that's of significant um, weather change or geographical change tornadoes yeah. volcanoes things like that yeah so um so there's the there's the you know drastic changes in temperature that we outlined um montana tends to get a lot of snow um it's it's known uh for glacier national park where um 
you know, there are still existing glaciers up there uh, from, from all the snow. So they get, they get a lot of that. Um, and then Montana also gets, especially when you're getting over to the eastern half of the state, they get some really extreme thunderstorms and uh, tornadoes as well. In fact, the year before I moved out of Montana, um, I became a trained, <laughs> trained weather spotter with, uh, with NOAA. Oh, wow. Uh, really? Uh, I didn't know that about you. I did, yeah. National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I, I took a class and became a trained weather spotter. And so I chased tornadoes the summer of 2010 out there, and they, they had 26 of them touched down recorded, which is high for Montana because they average about five a year. Um, mm. But yeah, when you get out to the eastern side of the state, that's the, the westernmost boundary of those, uh, those areas where the, uh, <clears throat> the moist gulf air mixes with the uh, the air coming in from the Pacific Ocean, and that's you know that's what creates Tornado Alley, and we're on the the very western border of that, northwestern border actually. That's oh, and as far as uh, earthquakes are concerned, Montana has quite a few. The Rocky Mountains um, that you know run the, they're the spine of the of North America. They run right through the western part of Montana, and of course those are created because of continental compression mm -hmm. with you know tectonic plates and so forth. Um, and so naturally, there's a lot of earthquakes that, that happen as a result of that. Um, the most significant thing I could probably uh, detail for you here would be Yellowstone National Park. Um, that is, um, you know, a piece of Earth's crust that is living over a hot spot. Um, and uh, anyway, long story short, it's the largest active volcano in the world. And when that thing blows, uh, there's a fairly it's good chance it. that... Um, a lot of our current species in the world, you know, both plants and animals, uh, are, you know, going to go away because it'll create a nuclear winter. So, yeah, pretty extreme stuff up there. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Uh, Yellowstone's supposed to have a. Uh, I mean, that that is a super volcano, if I'm correct. Yes. Yes, yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't erupted. Although, for people who are 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 the casual observer, they will of course note that there are geysers all throughout Yellowstone, and that's just letting you know that the hot springs are definitely in full force. Um, so there is that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if if you're if you're if you're preparing for this, you need to be aware that this stuff is not, you know, going away anytime soon. And I don't know that we know approximation when it would erupt, but there's of course you know speculation that it could be in the next hundred. 200 years something like that. I can speak to that. Oh, please. I'm a geology nerd as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, yeah, you're right. Yellowstone hasn't erupted uh, since humankind came into existence, but it has erupted at an interval of roughly once every 600,000 years for the past several million years. And actually, it's really interesting. If you look at a, a, a map of the United States, the first time that hot spot actually broke through the continental crust, uh, the crust was that that explosion actually occurred in, I think it's northwestern Nevada. So what I'm saying is, is that the North American plate is drifting, uh, at least that portion of the plate is drifting westward. Um, and this this volcano keeps erupting uh, at, at, a, at a period of every 600,000 years or so. The last time it erupted, it was 640,000 years ago. So technically we're overdue. However, I don't think there have been any significant indications out of um, the scientists in, in the park that, uh, you know, would point toward a massive eruption in the near future, you know, so. That's what I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I know that they have volcanologists working in Yellowstone at full, full you know, full time, just <laughs> to prevent something like this from happening. I was like, I, I, I wasn't aware that there were any immediate activity or there wasn't any immediate activity, but they are, it's one of those spots that they're watching because they're just, concerned about that it continues to seem to escalate as we continue to go along through this but it's not to the like super super danger level yet yeah not not currently yeah and you're right i think part of it is they want to monitor it for safety reasons and whatnot but uh, also there's that you know just the the fundamental scientists and all these people they want to understand more about um the feature uh because there's still a lot that's that's unknown about uh yellowstone um so yeah, it's it's really intriguing to think about, you know, that uh, <clears throat> that powerful of a force that's living right under the crust down there.
Oh yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the culture of the state of Montana. And I break the culture into a variety of different subcategories, but let's also talk um, in terms of religion. Are there any predominant religions that like permeate through the area? Um, I know that obviously, you know, you're within throwing stones distance of Utah. So there might be a, a larger than normal Mormon population, but you know, is, is Christianity for the most part, the predominant religion within the state of yeah. Montana? Yeah, um, Montana is primarily white American now, um, white, white Americans, uh, there's some Native Americans and then other ethnicities have filtered in throughout the centuries, uh, but primarily it's, it's um, you know, Christianity. There is, there's an element of Mormonism there. Um, and then you also have the Native American religions, um, religions that, you know, immigrants bring with them. Um, but those vary quite a bit. And uh, then you have, you know, Mennonites, Hutterites out there as well, some colonies that uh, you'll see out uh, near Great Falls where I used to live, where they live amongst themselves and run farms and um, they have their own religion as well as I understand it. Nice. Now, when we take a look at the arts in the state of Montana, um, is it one of those things where, like, and, and I equate the arts to whether it's the fine arts, um, be it sculpting, painting, dancing, or acting, singing. Uh, there are a few celebrities that appear to come from there. Obviously, uh, comedian Dana Carvey, I think, had lived there at one point. Huey Lewis has a space, a place there. Uh, Evil Knievel, um, I think, had a spot there. And then David Letterman, I think, recently moved uh, into the area. Uh, am I missing anybody of prominence, would you say? Uh, so Andy McDowell lives, or at least used to, when I was going to college there, she used to live in, um, Zula, the actress. Yeah. Um, Jeff Ament, the bass player for Pearl Jam was born and raised in Big Sandy, Montana, and he went to college at the University of Montana before he joined Pearl Jam. Okay. Um, and, uh, when I was working at a photo lab in Missoula, I actually got to meet him and joke around <laughs> Nice. Um, Tom Brokaw was rumored to have a place down there. Uh, Ted Turner, I believe, has property in Montana. Um, of course, Huey Lewis has a place down near uh, Stevensville in the um, Bitterroot Valley. Um, gosh, who am I leaving out? Gary Cooper. I don't know if he was actually from there or just lived there for a while. I know I'm leaving people out. There are so there's so many, but not there's so many celebrities. Not many of them come from Montana. <laughs> Um, if I think of another one, I'll probably just blurt it out. But yeah, I think you've got it pretty well covered here. Not a problem, man. Um, now, in terms of language, it's primarily either, like I would imagine it's majority English um, with a little bit of mixed native tongue in there somewhere, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, primarily English um, and the native tongue on the, the, the seven reservations that they have there in the state. And, uh, and of course, if um, if you you know any, any folks that um, end up living in Montana and immigrate to Montana, um, you know they might bring with them their their native language as well, but uh, primarily English. Very good. And now we move on to one of my favorite topics: diet and food. Um, I notice on this screen we have these berries. Um, they don't look like a conventional blackberry or anything like that. Are you familiar with these berries? Yeah, I think those are huckleberries. Um, I think they grow. I'm, I'm, now, I'm not a biology nerd, so I can't really, <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but I think they prim primarily grow in um, northern latitudes, the huckleberries. I, I used to, when I was in the Navy, I was stationed in Maine, and I know that huckleberries were big out there as well. Um, but yeah, you have, uh, huckleberries are really popular. It's kind of a state fruit, sort of, you know, <laughs> they, you'll see huckleberry jams and syrups and jellies and all that kinds of stuff. And if you, and if you haven't had the chance to try huckleberries and you do get the chance, take it because they're extraordinarily delicious. Well, how do they taste? <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had huckleberry before. Uh, they're about the size and um, I guess you could say consistency or toughness of a blueberry. So kind of like a blueberry, right? But they, uh, ooh, that's, that's tough. It's almost like if you married a blackberry and a blueberry. Oh, nice. 
I could yeah. deal with that. I, I like blueberries a lot. So blackberries, blackberries a little bit are, are interesting, but I'm, I'm much more of a blueberry fan. I can do it. The with huckleberries that. are very popular amongst the grizzly bears that live in Montana. Oh, okay. Well, I won't go picking them myself then. No. Uh, <laughs> I, now I've noticed a lot of pictures when I went online in terms of um, cinnamon rolls and things like that. And even like huckleberry, like cinnamon roll things and like that. But you said for the most part, it's, it's pretty much a meat and potatoes kind of town or, or, or state, correct? Yeah, it, it is primarily, you know, growing up, it was meat and potatoes. A lot of, there's a lot of German influence there, Norwegian, uh, Scandinavian. Um, sometimes you'll see things at the fair, like the Viking, which is almost like a meatloaf corn dog is basically if you can imagine meatloaf on a stick with batter that's what a viking is and that's really tasty lefsa is really popular um amongst the uh i think it's the scandinavians um what, what's it called in lefsa well i said norwegian and scandinavia but norway's part of scandinavia right? oh yeah yeah totally yeah. all right so don't, don't listen to me here but anyway yeah lefsa that's almost like a, a tortilla and oftentimes they put butter and sugar on it oh Nice. Uh, simple but tasty snack. Um, but yeah, if you wanted me to kind of talk about the good food in Montana, um, so as Shh. far as you know, we talked about agriculture being one of the big industries in Montana, and wheat is one of the wheat, not weed. Wheat <laughs> is one of the um, the biggest uh, products, right? And and. So anyway, growing up in Great Falls in the 70s, uh, right? I think it was in that during that decade, uh, a little company called Great Harvest Bread started up. Uh, and my, you know, my family and I in the mornings we'd go there and get these huge cinnamon rolls uh, that were whole wheat cinnamon rolls and butter and frosting and everything that works, and they were like a dollar or something. Um, absolutely delicious. Well, anyway, uh, Great Harvest has now grown to the point where they have 400 locations across the entire country. And so, oh, and wow. we used to eat at their very first store. So that came from there. Um, then nobody outside the state of Montana is going to know about this, but they should. There's a place there called the Staggering Ox. And it's a sandwich shop that started in Helena where I graduated from high school. And um, their sandwich design has actually been patented. So if you can, I'm trying to describe this, but if you can envision um, like a metal tube, uh, maybe the size of like those old bank things, you know, when you go to the credit union and push the, the thing up the tube, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Like a, like a cylinder, like a vacuum cylinder. Right, right, yeah, roughly that size. They fill it with dough. The thing splits in half, right, lengthwise. Yeah. But they fill it with dough, uh, bake it, and then they, you know, they pop it out and they take it apart and then you've got this tube of bread. They cut it in half and then they core out the center of each of those halves and then they replace the core with your with your um, ingredients like your lettuce onion tomato and your meats and your cheeses and so forth and um so it's it looks like a bread cup basically mm. uh but the ingredients they use are very good and they've been around for gosh i think since the 70s uh, making those sandwiches and they're very popular in montana um so the staggering ox, staggering ox design, and it is so delicious. They also have a place in Missoula called Biga Pizza, B-I-G-A, literally the best pizza I've ever had. And I, you know, I used to live on the East Coast. I used to live in California. Now I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I've never had better pizza than Biga Pizza in Missoula, Montana. It's insane. Is there a specific style of pizza that you would classify it under? Like I know when I go to Chicago, they have the deep dish. Over in New York, they have like the full slices that are like the size of my chest um like how like and and then again i've been to italy about three times now and it it never gets tiring for me to ever go there no. um but like how would you like what kind of a like what kind of pizza would you say distinct like what why is it so special i think it's more like a new york style versus a chicago style um it's the their crust is just incredibly flavorful and they cook it in a wood fire brick oven type thing and then the ingredients and the combination of ingredients. I think they're just using excellent ingredients. And um, somebody with some culinary uh, education, I think, is probably back there cooking because you can tell these pizzas aren't just slapped together like your garden variety <laughs> pizza shop. They are very well crafted. And the, from the first bite, instantly I knew it was going to be an amazing pizza. Um, so, but that's, gosh, outside of the huckleberries, the 
those staggering ox sandwiches and the big pizza, I can't really think of anything else that's uh, incredibly good food wise that comes out of Montana, unfortunately. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. If it's distinctive to Montana, that's why I'm here to, I want to know about it. Um, but let's talk about the sports teams also within the area in terms of culture, sports and recreation. There's no major league teams, but I don't know if there's any like a farming league or anything that's up in the area. Um, but there are obviously college teams too. Yeah. Um, so, right. No, well, the only professional team they have is part of that indoor football league. I think it's called the Billings Mustangs or something like that. No, that's the baseball team. Uh, sorry, it's escaping me right now, but they have an indoor football team, uh, which is a, it's, it's, a, it's another league that's akin to a, arena league football. Um, and they're actually pretty good. When I lived there in 2000, uh, like eight or nine, I think they won the national championship, but you know, uh, nothing, nothing too big. Uh, outside of that, they've got farm baseball teams. Um, and then, then you go to your colleges and you've got uh, the university of Montana, which is unequivocally the best uh, school in that state. Um, for lots of reasons, I'm a little biased because I went there, but, um, and then there's Montana state university, uh, which is over in Bozeman, and then Carroll College in Helena. Um, I think Montana is known for its, uh, University of Montana is known for its legal pro law program, uh, its forestry program, uh, some of its liberal arts programs. MSU is more of a research type university. They, they've got some really good science programs over there. And then uh, Carroll College, um, to be honest, I don't know what kind of school, I know it's a religious school. Uh, they have a religious affiliation, I think it's Catholic. I'm not sure what programs they really offer there. But uh, I know they have a really strong football program like the University of Montana does. And I want to say they've been around for a long time, you know, or at least to the best of my knowledge, at least. Um, let's also move into holidays really quick, because not that there's any state holiday specific to the state of Montana, but there is an unusual festival. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh... Brace yourself. It's called the Testicle Festival. Um, to my knowledge, it's still going on. It occurs one one time per year, usually in September. It's over, uh, I would say it's southeast of Missoula uh, near Rock Creek. Um, and they have a big lodge there. And it's it's like a mini Sturgis kind of thing. Um, so lots of, lots of shenanigans going on there. But you can definitely find uh, lots of Rocky Mountain oysters at the Testicle Festival. And for those who don't know what Rocky Mountain oysters are, they are bull testes. So <laughs> again, don't really know where that tradition came about, but you know, it's one of those things that some people, it, it's, a, it's a rite of passage, I think is the best term that I would use for that. Could be, yeah. Um, it's not a lot to do in Montana <laughs> unless you're super into the outdoors. Uh, so I think this just might be... Uh, situation where people are getting kind of bored and creative maybe there you go but. let's actually funny that you mentioned that let's talk about the population because as you said it is the population tends to be sparse but there are these little pockets that i can see that are on my map here uh, where there's a little bit more red can you tell me about some of these areas that i'm seeing here that are standing out yeah just go ahead and pick whichever one you want to talk about point it point at it with your mouse cursor and i'll talk about it. that that the one you're circling there is Billings, Montana. That's the largest city in Montana. And the population I think is, at this time is about 150,000. So that's once again, the biggest city in Montana. Do we know what's right here? That would be uh, Butte. I believe that's Butte. Okay. No, well, wait no. a minute. That's, that's actually, no, that's Bozeman. I'm sorry. That's Bozeman? Okay. Yeah. Is this that is, That's Great Falls. Oh, that's Great Falls, okay. And then when we get over to here, closer to the Idaho border. That's Missoula. That's Missoula. Okay. Yeah. Where, where is Butte? Do you know where Butte would be? Butte, if you go to, oh, shoot, I don't, well, okay. You remember, you, you're right near Bozeman right there. Head west, you'll see sort of a faint tan dot. Tan dot. Keep going up a little north. That, that one, one, I think, is Butte. Okay, got it. And Butte is famous for uh, mining, copper mining and, and uh, silver mining in particular. 50% of the copper used in World War II came out of Butte, Montana. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, actually, 
funny that you mentioned that. Let's actually talk about the economy within Montana. Now, when I look up the biggest employers of the state, I was really quite surprised to see that the Blackfoot Nation or the Blackfeet Nation um, has a huge, they, they are a huge employer within the state of Montana, but as is the Billings Clinic, uh, the obviously Montana State University, University of Montana, uh, St. Vincent's, and there's also an Air Force base that's pretty prominent within the state of Montana as well. Um, what other what other prominent employers may I be leaving out? Well, there's a lot of timber and a lot of mining. Um, so there's you know some timber timber companies up there. I, I don't know any names off the top of my head. I haven't lived there for about a decade. Was Anaconda uh, one of them? Anaconda Mining was what it was it called the uh, Anaconda uh, Copper is what it's mm. called. It's a mining company. It was started in 1881 by Marcus Daly, who was a copper baron there in Montana. And uh, yeah, so a lot of a lot of mining goes on. Um, tourism is really big. So you have, um, you know, your national parks like Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park for an exa- as examples where there's, uh, you know, quite a few employees, but those are, those can be seasonal. Um, yeah, I think you pretty much covered the, I mean, there, there are probably some other ones that I'm not remembering. Um, with the uh, the Air Force Base, that's up there in Great Falls where I grew up, and they have the 391st Missile Wing out there. And so um, that in, around Great Falls and the land around there, uh, you'll see lots of missile silos. They have tons of intercontinental ballistic missiles in the ground up there. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't uncommon when I was a boy growing up there to see these convoys of uh, like blue Humvees and uh, blue semi trucks hauling nuclear weapons around the streets of Great Falls. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, Great Falls, you remember the, well, I don't know if you were alive during this time, but the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, um, Great Falls, Malmstrom Air Force Base was on high alert and ready to launch um, right where I grew up. So, yeah. That, that, that would have that that been a very ugly situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, thankfully cooler heads prevailed. So yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about the transportation within the area. Now, uh, Montana has the Montana Department of Transportation. How are the roads within the state of Montana and the highways? So your interstates are pretty darn good. When you get to your secondary highways, they're they're kind of iffy. Uh, your city roads just depends on what year it is. <laughs> and then <laughs> your uh, country roads. And there are millions of miles of those. Those are just awful. Um, but Montana's roads, I would say, generally speaking, compared to other states, I think they're typically a bit worse because of the, the extremes and weather, the temperatures, the moisture. Um, you get a lot of ice heaves in the road uh, with, you know, water freezing in between cracks, breaking the road up. There are tons of potholes. And Montana doesn't have a ton of money, and I don't think they contribute or dedicate, a, you know, a ton of the, the state budget to roads. Not as much as they should anyway. So generally speaking, I think they're not as good. But the interstates, you know, if you just love a nice relaxing country drive with some of the most spectacular scenery in the world, pick any interstate of Montana and and you'll have a great time. Very nice. What about in terms of major airports, major train ports, or like any river ports in the area? No, uh, there's there's an international airport in Great Falls. I believe there's one in Billings as well. Um, and then the rest of them are all regional, I think. Um, and the Missouri River, the headwaters of the Missouri start in Montana near three, what was it, Three Forks, Montana, I believe, which is kind of by Bozeman. Okay. Um, and the Missouri River eventually empties into the Mississippi, I think. Um, but not a whole lot of commerce on the Missouri River. So, um, yeah. No, nothing really to speak to there, unfortunately. Not a problem. Let's talk then really quickly about the government. And I, again, I don't like to get into politics on my channel, but you know, in terms of the government of the state of Montana, it seems pretty much reliably conservative uh, for the most part. Although it's been my observation with interviewing people about all the various different states, it seems like the the more centralized locations where we have larger cities, those tend to be more democratic than conservative. Is, is that also my same observation? Is that accurate within the state of Montana, would you say? Yeah, I'd say that's an accurate assessment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's red state primarily, but you'll have little clusters of 
uh, blue clusters in your more populated areas, particularly in Missoula and uh, Bozeman. Okay. And then as you may mention, um, copper, huge resource uh, for mining in the state of Montana, but also gold and silver. Um, anything else that I'm leaving out? Obviously, agriculture, you said, is a huge uh, driver in the state as well. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is huge. Uh, Mining is huge. We talked about copper, silver, gold, uh, platinum, and palladium, I believe, are both mined there. Um, a lot of precious gems like uh, diamonds, lots of sapphires. The Yogo Sapphire, Y-O-G-O, Yogo Sapphire, that's found in only two places on Earth, Montana and somewhere in South Africa, I think. Um, it's a deep blue sapphire, um, and they are generally appraised very well because uh, they're more rare. Um, yeah, in fact, mining used to be so commonplace that when I was a kid growing up in the 80s in Helena, you could visit any number of mines and pay 20 or $30 for a bucket of concentrate. So you'd go out to the hills, dig in the hills with a shovel, put that, that dirt into a bucket, and then you go sort through it. And then any gems you found, you got to keep. And my family found, I'm not kidding, thousands of dollars worth of uh, sapphires and uh, garnets, some rubies. Um, two of those sapphires now live in my wife's wedding ring. Wow. Oh. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. So we found those when I was a kid and now she, now she has them. She owns that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. In terms of the education structure in the state of Montana, I mean, there's, there's a few colleges that stand out, obviously Montana State University, Carroll College, like we mentioned earlier, University of Montana has a number of different campus locations throughout the state. Um, what can you tell me about, like, are there any other prominent colleges or maybe, like, what is the literacy rate in the state of Montana? Do you know, is it in, on the higher spectrum and lower spectrum? Uh, the literacy rate in Montana is uh, right around 90%, I believe. Okay. Very cool. 90, 91%. Um, and just kind of speaking from experience, you know, growing up in the public school system, um, I, I feel like I was very, very well prepared. Um, but then again, I went to school in the 70s and 80s and first part of the 90s. So who knows if it's as good as it used to be. But uh, but yeah, when I was going through it, I felt like it was pretty rigorous, um, very comprehensive education. Um, and then, you know, at the University of Montana, I had a really great educational experience there as well. So um, yeah, if, if there are certain areas like forestry or, you know, law or, um, you know, certain areas of science that you uh, are interested in, then there are some great programs there, so. Excellent. Then finally, in terms of security and safety, not a lot to speak of in the state of Montana. I'm, I, there is a little bit, uh, there's no, no real foreign terrorism threats that come to the state, which, which really surprises me with a large nuclear arsenal. But the, there are some domestic terrorism concerns with white nationalism and things like that that will sometimes pop up. Um, correct, am I, am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, generally, yeah, on a national level, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any um, major issues as far as, uh, you know, white supremacist groups. Uh, there are, I think there are a handful of those and, in, in, you know, dotting, you know, dotted throughout the state, but um, no major issues as of late. I know the Unabomber, um, the older folks, I remember him, he, uh, resided in Lincoln, Montana for a period, but he wasn't from, I'll have everybody know he wasn't from Montana. So he's, he's not one of ours. <laughs> he came from somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, no major crime there. Um, no, no foreign terrorism or anything. You just have to worry about those Canadians coming down and clogging up the roads during the uh, shopping season. That's about it. Terrible, those snowbirds. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> so l let's just wrap this up really quick on a positive note. Um, so let's say, uh, for example, I have a plane ticket to come to Montana in a quick, like maybe 30 seconds or even a minute. Can give me a, give me a reason. Why do I want to come to Montana really quick? The lack of people, the very easygoing lifestyle, it's very relaxed there. You can go down, you can go to Montana and completely recharge uh, especially if you're a person who really enjoys the outdoors, um, 
there's so much to see there. Um, there's Glacier National Park, which has been called the crown of the continent. Um, and it uh, borders uh, Waterton National Park, I believe, I believe that's what it's called. That's, in, that's the Canadian side of Glacier National Park, it's the first international park ever established. There's Yellowstone up there. Um, Big Sky Ski Resorts, the largest ski area in the United States. That's uh, south of Bozeman, so there's some great skiing there. Um, there is still some opportunity for some, you know, um, some mining if you if you want to do that. Although um, that's that's going to be more limited than it used to be. But uh, but yeah, really, I think that the main reasons you're going to go to Montana is it's for the the beauty and the easygoing lifestyle. It's just so wide open, so little traffic, so few people, and so much to see. Um, I just recommend, you know, carving out as much time as you can because, uh, you know, it's a big state and to see all the, the real good stuff, you, you, you need a little time to get across that big state, uh, but it's, it's just um, some of the most spectacular scenery you've seen uh, anywhere in the world. Beautiful. Scott, it has been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing this with my students. I know I learned a lot and I really appreciate your time and sharing that with us. So thank you so much. Oh, you're more than welcome. And yeah, anytime you want more information on Montana, I didn't, I didn't share all my tidbits today, so I've got more if you need it. <laughs> I will hold you to that, sir. Thank you again for your time. Uh, you betcha. Yeah, thank you. This has been fun. Now, for my students that are out there who have questions or comments that they would like to know more about, please feel free to send me an email at scott at theprofessortravel.com. If you're on YouTube right now and you'd like to know when new videos get uploaded, Click that bell icon right at the top of the page in order to be notified when those come up. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything and it definitely helps out the channel. If you like this content and you would like to receive more of it in the future, give us a thumbs up. Let us know about it. And then finally, if you're on the if you're on the podcast and you're hearing this, please feel free to rate us and review us. We really do appreciate it. So until next time, my name is Scott. I am the Professor Travel. Make every day a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.